All right, good timing, everybody. We are right at 11.30, so I'm just gonna get moving on this sucker. Uh, welcome, good morning. Uh, this is Getting Started Using Personalization. Uh, my name is Jim Barnhouse. I work at uh, SpecBee. We are a Drupal-only development, design, and Drupal-focused SEO agency. We are here at, uh, I'm not gonna talk a ton about SpecBee, but we are here at booth 608, right by the Hounder guys, with the hand pour coffee, the, the really good stuff. Uh, we have swag today. Yesterday it did not show up on time, so uh, come and get the swag. Last year we did the free t-shirt holders, because you're, you're all gonna get a lot of free t-shirts, so we had like a bag for that. Then we kept on hearing feedback that uh, I can't fit all these things in my luggage, so this year we brought a vacuum sealer. So you can bring it to our booth, bring all your swag, We'll vacuum seal it. We're optimizing your luggage. Get it? So it's like SEO, but for your luggage. Uh, so come on by. Get all that stuff. We got other fun things we're doing too. Um, but today we're talking about getting started with personalization. Um, this was kind of tricky to put together uh, because how do you talk about personalization without getting in some of the technical aspects of it? Um, the tools are out there. What we're gonna focus on is the practical aspects of personalization, um, the, what, what things you need to do, what you need to watch out for. Um, I, we, I'll bring this up probably multiple times throughout this presentation, but uh, we've worked with a lot of organizations that get started on personalization and then find they're in way too over their heads and then pull back. So we're gonna, the, the real key to getting started is knowing how this fits your organization's needs. But first, we're gonna do a quick what and why. I assume everybody in the room probably knows something about personalization, maybe you've seen the tools out there, but for anybody who's just like, I've never heard of it, so I'm coming to this, we gotta do this. Uh, what is personalization? Tailoring content, recommendations, and interactions on your website to the needs and preferences of your users. Uh, if I have to explain personalization to my mom, uh, I reference Amazon and uh, the recommended products, these are actually mine. I just screenshot this and threw it on here. I got uh, children's allergy medicine, of course, it's springtime, retinol. Uh, we have dermatologist friends that are like, retinol is the best thing for, this is another tip for you guys, for, for keeping wrinkles away. Uh, but don't come to us, just get it on Amazon because it's way cheaper and it's the same stuff. I'm actually 67 years old. <laughs> so, uh, Let's see, hair stuff, obviously, uh, gum, it's, we're at a conference, all this kind of thing. So uh, Amazon uh, knows what I might buy. Uh, why does it matter? Uh, number one, enhancing user engagement. Um, users are more likely to stay longer, uh, explore further, take further actions. Um, number two, drive conversions. Uh, that can be something like making a big purchase, like with Amazon, or even just uh, uh, signing up for a newsletter or uh, just engaging more with your content. And then number three, create more human experience. So um, uh, human experience, what I mean by that is uh, you've all been in presentations before where, uh, or, or sales pitches where they come into the room and they go, I want this to be conversational. I want to have back and forth. And what they're trying to do is personalize the, whatever they're gonna say to you, right? And, and back, and those kind of presentations are great. Uh, this is not that type of presentation. This is basically a static website. I'm gonna be showing you guys all this stuff, and if you have questions, please feel free to, to stop and, and ask them. Um, I am also a very well-known fast talker. I have like notes throughout this entire thing to slow down, but that's gonna be very difficult for me because I just go. So uh, if anybody's having trouble catching up or whatever, just be like, hey, Jim, shut up for a minute. Go back on that. Uh, anyways, yes, please feel free to ask questions at any time. So our objectives today, um, again, not what type of personalization uh, you should be using, um, everyone here will have different audience segments, different goals. Uh, it's impossible, impossible for me to tell you what you should be doing uh, just in this format. Um, that said, uh, if we get a good understanding of uh, th these listed objects here, uh, we can set you up for success. So number one, realistically plan for adding personalization to your website. The, the key phrase here is realistically. 
Um, we'll discuss best practices uh, to prepare yourself for personalization. Number two is set boundaries on applicable scope. Uh, personalization can get very complex, so that, that, that leads to boundaries on scope. Um, we've got tips on how not to get in over your head. And then number three, connect organizational goals to actionable projects. Uh, that's the number one goal, ROI. Uh, personalization, it takes time and it takes money. It, sometimes both uh, at the same time. This means proving success by tying your actions to measurable goals. Uh, we're gonna talk about the best ways to show what you're doing is worth the investment. That's gonna be important. Uh, before we get into the practical, though, uh, we do need to be, we need to talk about the uh, types or ways you can personalize. Uh, these days, personalization is often thought of as a big suite, big software, um, but there, there are lots of ways it can be done at a much smaller scale. Uh, we're going to do a quick overview of uh, the whole range of common ways to personalize uh, without being too exhaustive, uh, because it would take up this whole session. Um, but uh, you might be a small or medium-sized organization. I think that's what was in the session notes. If you know, this is personalization for small to medium-sized teams. Um, if you have no budget, no time, uh, we're going to start with the easy stuff, and then uh, lead to the bigger ones. So, uh, because I guess it's it's important to know what you can scale to, right? Um, so some of these you're going to be very aware of. Some of the, you might already be doing some of these, but bear with me as we go through these, just these, these ranges of things. And this isn't, again, exhaustive, but it's something. All right, A-B testing. Is A-B testing personalization? Let me take a drink of water on that one. Even the biggest personalization strategies are based on testing, um, data analysis, and then uh, continuous improvement. Uh, so that does include A-B testing. Even if you're in the biggest suite, you're going to be A-B testing stuff. Uh, and, and, and the goals to A-B testing are similar. Uh, insight on what content resonates, uh, improving engagement. And the best part, uh, because we're talking about uh, just getting started, is that most of you can do this with, the, with existing tools, right? Uh, it's an easy way to improve results. The smallest little step, A-B testing. Geolocation, this is a pretty, one of our biggest requests for high ed. Um, uh, this is Im equally important for international organizations or uh, so associations that have local chapters, um, or even people have brick and mortar locations. Um, all we're doing here is changing content based on visitors' IP address. Uh, so multi-region promotions, e-commerce is obvious one for that if you're have distributors and you want to have different pricing for different regions, that's that kind of thing. Uh, local events, a nonprofit might have locally specific events all across the country. They want to be able to promote that stuff to people that are local to that event. So they're changing their content to make sure that that's at the top of the page for them. Um, local content and contact, in contact info. Uh, sometimes it's just making sure that the correct contact info is on a call to action, you know, that kind of simple thing. But Language change automation, this is easily the most common one. Uh, that's the big reason why people use geolocation. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, uh, we have a university that draws a lot of international students. Um, of course, they wanna automate the language for those international students, but sometimes it's just specific uh, calls to action on the homepage. Sometimes they just wanna have a, a pop-up that just shows up for international students so they can welcome them and, and make them feel like they're, they're, they're at the right place. Um, and you might say, what about VPNs? Uh, yeah, that is an issue. Um, but it's not one that's usually big enough to make it not worth it. So uh, there's, there's no perfect system. Browser history. Uh, we're talking user cookie history here uh, for your own website. Uh, returning visitors are important visitors. Uh, they're returning, so it's uh, safe to assume they're interested. Um, some examples here, post-conversion, recommendations based on a purchase or donation history. So just like my, my Amazon recommendations, if a, if a nonprofit was successful in getting a donation, um, they can start to promote other ways to help. They've got the donation, now maybe you're gonna push for uh, uh, volunteering or something like that. Um, just not always giving them the same stuff every single time. 
um, content suggesting articles based on previously read topics. More relate, related information is a great way to keep people invested and in, uh, in, in engaging. And then calls to action, first time visitor versus a returning visitor. So signing up for a newsletter versus sharing the newsletter. If somebody's already signed up for your newsletter, why do you keep on hitting them head to sign up again, right? Can you adjust based on what you know about the user just through cookies, right? Um, you, you, you see the potential issue here, uh, cookie consent. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about data privacy a little later, uh, and I'm sure you're all very excited to get to that part, um, but for sure that is becoming a, a, a bigger issue with personalization in general. All right, online marketing UTMs. UTMs are that, that snippet at the end of a URL that, uh, you, that you use when you're tracking, tracking your marketing uh, initiatives and ads. Um, the most common scenario is where you adjust a landing page based on who, whatever was in the ad. Um, and it can be subtle. Uh, for example, you might have two Facebook ads um, that, that, that have the same content, but the images shown are different. So for a university, you might have a, uh, a sports, you know, might have a group of students in a library, same content, but the images group, group of students in the library. And then the other one is students at a sporting event. And what you would do with that is, depending on which ad they came from, you might adjust the imagery on the landing page so that uh, it maybe short, shows more school spirit related stuff versus the more uh, education stuff or, or, or classes. Um, just the imagery, and we're not changing the content in that landing page necessarily, but what we are doing is giving the right vibe. And that's important to start building your, uh, increase your conversions for, for marketing. Okay, now we're gonna get into uh, the real meat of personalization. Uh, this is how most people think of personalization these days, platforms or software. And uh, yeah, CRMs, DXPs, um, Hub HubSpot, Salesforce, et cetera. These are the types of things that people are using for this. These are kind of hazy platforms to talk about because uh, they all have different features, tools, uh, automations, levels of what you pay to get. I'm sure you guys have all seen that kind of stuff. Um, it would take up a whole session to talk about what you could do with all these things. Um, there are some examples up here, uh, but, but if you're at this point in exploring personalization, uh, you're probably pretty aware of what these can do. Um, the key takeaway from this slide is this is integrating uh, a system with your website so that marketing can leverage real customer data. Um, and while it's improving audience segment uh, intelligence, most of this kind of software can automate the marketing and the uh, personalization of the website itself. So if you're just getting into personalization and you've seen these tools out there and you don't know what they do, the, the bigger ones all are gonna have tons of stuff on their website and they'll have uh, ways that you can test through it and see what it actually does. Um, but you can also stop by booth 608 and we'll tell you more about it, I guess. Um, the next step up is CDP. Uh, and again, in, in some cases, uh, these bleed into what a DXP can do. Uh, this is kind of a constantly changing environment. Everybody's coming up with new tools and new ways to do things. Um, but for CDP identification purposes, think Acquia Convert. That's one of the big ones that's being pushed out there right now, that, uh, it, it's, it's, and it's an awesome system. Um, we're talking about hyper-personalization. So, this is where you're getting into real-time personalization and smart reporting. Um, so you're automatically changing content based on real-time visitor interactions. Um, something uh, really helpful uh, that is getting more implemented in these type of things is AI. Um, you can get anything from content recommendations down to uh, uh, automating some of the analysis and that'll that can save you a lot of time. We're, we're gonna talk about time shortly. So when you get up into these bigger ones, um, they, there are ways that they're trying to shorten the amount of time that it takes to handle them. Uh, but yes, stop by booth, booth 608 if you wanna hear more about it. Okay, so we just went through the hot ones, uh, gauntlet, the little spicy to the big spicy. 
um, you're interested in personalization, where do you begin? So planning and putting personalization into practice. The first step for, uh, is identifying uh, team limitations with time, personnel, and technology. Uh, how much can you really bite off? Uh, here's some of the things you should be doing. Budget time for analytics, reporting, and content changes. We're gonna get into the importance of this, uh, but first ask yourself, do you have the ability to, to block your time to handle the ongoing effort this is going to take? Number two, understand lift staff limitations. Uh, do you have the technical capability? Um, proper training is something to keep in mind. Uh, number three, go, get initial buy-in and coordination with other departments. Is, is anyone in your organization really that interested in personalization? Uh, some of this may take educating, educating your stakeholders. And then, uh, 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 where was that? Number four, um, often personalization takes integrations. Uh, do you have the partner for it? Can you do it internally? And number five, financial budget. If, if you have a level of personalization in mind, what is a realistic budget for your organization? Define the goals with, with your organization. So this is aligning internally. Uh, collect stakeholder goals. Uh, even if your organization is on board, collaborating on goals with your stakeholders gives them skin in the game. Um, you're gonna need their support later as things grow. Um, number two, advocate for multi-department cohesion and combined strategy. I heard a lot about this yesterday when I was talking about personalization with, with some organizations. Uh, because this is a collaborative effort, you need to keep engaging. Um, I've seen it happen where you're, you're working on your original goal that you agreed upon, and then uh, suddenly the marketing team uh, changes their goal, and you're not, no one let you know. Uh, so it, it, it can get pretty rough if you're not constantly communicating these efforts with your teams. Um, determine KPIs for goals. Keep them invested by reporting based on KPIs. Uh, showing ongoing improvement toward your agreed upon goal will be rewarded with patience. We'll get more into that a little bit too. So, determine technology needs some equals. You've got your stakeholder goals, you know your, you know your KPIs, uh, your team has availability, how should you build it out? These are a few good places to start. Uh, even if you're starting small, uh, it's a good idea to talk to your web partner uh, about your plans if you have a web partner or internal web partners. Uh, they'll probably have tools to suggest that can help you stay efficient or uh, can give you any heads up on technical issues you might have. Uh, number two, existing Drupal modules like smart content. Like I mentioned before, you don't need a full suite uh, to get started. Many of the strategies we talked about when we were going through that gauntlet uh, can be done with fully supported Drupal modules. Um, check out smart content. Um, it's a module by the folks over at Elevated Third. We use it all the time. It's, it's fantastic. You can do a lot of personalization with it from an existing module within Drupal. Um, and of course, we have the bigger platforms, uh, some, some of who specialize in this type of stuff. If you're ready to jump in there, they have all the resources you need to help you get going. Execute. Uh, once you're finally ready to execute, uh, you want to make sure you're setting yourself up for success. So reporting methods agreed upon. Your KPIs and reporting schedule is decided and agreed upon with your organization. Uh, pledge support from other teams. If, 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 if you're in marketing, you have IT ready and willing, vice versa. Um, milestones for next steps planned. This is a, another key piece. So if you're hitting your milestones, what's next? Uh, this ties back to starting small and scaling. If, if your ultimate goal is your very first milestone, it, the time it takes to get there is going to feel very, very long. Uh, so hitting the intermedi intermediary milestones, um, it will help you get further support for however you're hoping to scale, uh, show continuous improvement, right? So don't make your, your number one goal be the only goal. Try to find those steps in between. 
Uh, another important thing is to have those scaling needs pre-planned. Uh, that way, when you are ready to go into the next steps, uh, you don't need to go advocate again. Um, set those expectations with your teams and your stakeholders. Which leads to managing expectations. Um, we're going to be in a constant cycle of testing, analyzing, adjusting. Uh, these things take time. Prepare your stakeholders. Uh, equally important, don't wait six months to report. Show your results, both good and bad. Uh, if you can show consistent improvement, those bad results are, 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 are just organizational learnings. This is, sometimes you find stuff out that is really useful for the rest of the teams within your organization to go, oh, we've been thinking about that wrong. Um, uh, anyways, yeah, all right, I'm done with that slide. <laughs> Best practices and tips. Uh, so we got through some of the initial, initial planning. Uh, folks seem to be on board. What things should you be keeping in mind in both the beginning and during? I'm going to say this a lot in this. Start small. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, so we're going to touch on this a ton of times. But starting small keeps you from getting overwhelmed by going too far too fast. Uh, the best ways to do that are uh, to identify where you think the, the biggest impact will be and start there. Um, that's going to be di different for everybody in this room, but you'll, if you can determine what your biggest impact would be from doing this, that's where you should focus. And then uh, grow your initiatives as you learn more about your audience. Once you're, you start getting and analyzing your data, uh, your next steps to scaling will be much more clear. So when at, this is all about once you get your data, you will have a, I better, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but that's what we mean. Continuous optimizing. User preferences and behavior evolves over time. Uh, so gather feedback from your visitors. Uh, so much about personalization is uh, analysis and adjusting. It's helpful to get back up for your results with data from multiple sources. And we'll talk more about data sources in, in a few minutes here. Um, analyzing metrics often are refined. Just because something works for a while doesn't mean it always will. On top of that, don't rest on your wins. Uh, you can continue to make them better. Uh, keep testing, keep refining. Do it for the visitor. Um, Enhanced user experience, don't detract. So this is a scenario that often gets pushed from higher ups. Uh, you've had some su success. Uh, now they want to leverage this new practice. Um, be sure your user experience is helpful, valuable, and relevant. Ask yourself if this, if this is helping the user. Uh, forcing unnecessary user journeys can be alienating, feel weird. Uh, keep relevance and value in mind. There's a fine line between what's good for the organization and what's good for the user. Uh, don't let your organization objectives outweigh the experience. Again, this is a fine line. So it's just something to be mindful of as you're building the, your content out and as you're adjusting things and as you're getting feedback from, from the rest of your teams. Experiment. Experimentation fosters learning. Uh, what works for others might not work for your organization. A lot of organizations make decisions, decisions based on what their competitors are doing. And it's something you can certainly test, but don't rely on that as gospel. When, if you're doing this right, you can really outpace any sort of your competition if they're not doing this sort of setup for personalization. Uh, test new ideas. Just try things that, that make sense. And then learn from success and failure. Uh, what I really want you to take away from this slide is that it's okay to fail if you're actively analyzing and, and improving, uh, adjusting to course correct. Like I said before, some of those failures will give you uh, really good insight for the rest of your company. Changes in organizational goals. Re-engage when, when big personnel changes happen. Um, this isn't a best practice that's, that's uh, considered very often. But like I said at the beginning, personalization requires time and or money. ROI is everything. Uh, so what happens when you lose a stakeholder or there's a change in management? Uh, get in the room with the new folks. 
make sure they understand the improvements that you've been making and then ask if they have new or different goals. Um, if your old goals don't align with what the new people are trying to make happen, your wins don't matter as much anymore. You could still keep on winning, but it's not, it's not what they care about. Um, share your discoveries that may shift organizational thinking. Uh, counter, this is what we've been touching on a little bit, but counter to your organization changing, changing goals, uh, you may find yourself on the other end of that. Uh, if you make a discovery that can potentially change how your organization thinks of things, uh, share your thoughts and data that backs that up. One of my favorite stories to tell is how uh, there was a telecom uh, that we were working with that had a, uh, a shopping experience for their small business customers. And one of the things that they were seeing is that there was a, some weird thing where people weren't buying phone service. So everything else was going great, but that one was a problem. Uh, so through testing and, and analyzing, they figured out people were getting all the way to their cart and then just canceling. And the reason they discovered why is because they just had a branded name for their phone service. It was like, you know, Superphone or whatever they called it. Uh, and people thought that they were buying mobile service, but it was really landline that they were buying. So they'd get all the way to the end of this, this, this entire process, this long process, putting all their information and then going, oh, I don't want a landline. So what that led to is, once it was brought to leadership, they ended up doing a whole rebranding of all their products, all their services, just to make them more clear. This is something they've been doing for years and didn't realize it was an issue. Uh, so you, you can make big changes with this stuff. And when it comes from IT and marketing, it's a big win for all of us IT and marketing people. So, yeah. All right. They don't tell you how much this makes you thirsty while you're talking up here. Uh, all right, so common hurdles. We've talked a little bit about some of these, uh, but it's especially important to underline them uh, if, if you're a small to medium-sized team. So, I, well, maybe I should have asked this earlier and made this more personalized. Has anybody in here put personalization in with their organization? Has anybody gone through that process? Seen any hurdles? What were your hurdles? Oh, okay. All right, no, 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 go through now. That's all right. Why don't you save it? Anybody else started to try personalization? What kind of hurdles did you see? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, th those, those are... A, one of the biggest issues, right? So uh, some of that learning comes from when you get into the bigger systems that have more analytics tools. In the end, it comes down to analysis and understanding what, 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 what you're missing. So, it, and that could have been a situation too, that often happens when they're changing too much stuff because suddenly they don't have a good feeling on what did what. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a common one. We'll, we'll have some of that in here. Um, any issues implementing it? Did you, what tool did you use? Did you have a tool? We're trying to figure out how to implement it still currently. Okay. It's been trying for a number of years, actually. So, uh, smart loss is very, uh, I'm going to just do that manually, but it looks like it's done a lot of it for me. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm quite exhausted. Right, right. Yeah. Um, well, let's get through some of these hurdles that you might need to watch out for. Uh, this is the biggest trap, going too far too fast. I'm going to say it again, start small. Um, keep your segmentation and user journeys to a manageable level. Uh, I, the more paths you create, the more there is to manage. I've seen so many teams jump right in and create different content for all their segments, all their audiences. Uh, what they get, where they get caught up is the more you segment, and the more user flows, the more you need to change, uh, the more you need to manage. And I get it, it's, it's exciting. You're getting uh, a ton of new insights, uh, new information, and this is exactly what you're doing it for, right? Um, the problem you face now is that the insights you're getting usually mean you need to take an action. And, that, and that's usually content changes. Uh, but a lot of times, content changes for uh, every audience, every journey you've set up, um, 
and if you've already set, set up a ton of segments, uh, you've got a lot of work to do suddenly. Uh, and then while you're out doing that, uh, suddenly you see a change that affects KPIs negatively somewhere else, uh, and, and now you're just scrambling. And that, that is a very common story when we're talking about personalization. I've seen so many organizations just give up and go back to basics. They just said, you know what, tried it, didn't work, it was too confusing, we couldn't, we couldn't make it work, and they just drop it. And then, they've, then you've lost your ROI, right? You've, you've spent time and money on it, and you've got nothing to show for it. Uh, so I've been hearing these stories all week already about personalization, personalization and, and not starting slow. Uh, start slow. I want to just keep on saying that. Uh, the other thing here is just hitting visitors over the head with personalization. Um, it's not as common, but some organizations do overdo it. Uh, the good news are, is people are getting used to these types of experiences now, so it's not as big of an issue, but uh, if, if I'm on a website and it's dropping my name everywhere and telling me what I did last time, it, it, it starts to get over the edge of a little creepy. A uh, little, little like, all right, this is a, this is a lot. What are they tracking on me? Um, so just be careful of that. Visitor, visitor, customer data. So our next hurdle is data related. This is also a big problem. Um, keeping your customer data up to date. Uh, you might say, what if your current customer data uh, is already a mess? Well, yeah, that that's a, that's a big problem too. Um, but I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, but Number one, in organizations where manual updating of customer data is required, data hygiene is critical for proper personalization. So uh, it, it, not everyone is gonna have perfectly hygiene data, um, especially if you're updating from a manual way. Um, this is something you need to take seriously though because when you're dealing with poor data, uh, you're gonna have trouble getting truth out of your analytics, right? Which may lead to choices based on illusions rather than facts. That's a major problem. Um, and here's another thing uh, that I was hearing a lot about yesterday too, data silos. Uh, it can be especially difficult in organizations where uh, they have data silos between departments. Uh, uh, different systems that aren't sharing or, uh, or, or contain duplicate, da duplicate data, uh, that, that can really start muddying your analytics and, and, and what your personalization does. Uh, this happens a lot where there are two different departments that, you, that don't play nice together or they have different systems. Uh, get that buy-in if you can. We're gonna talk, or we've talked about getting that buy-in from your other audiences within your organization. Get that buy-in if you can because if you can get your data straight, you'll have a much better time at this. SEO issues. Not everybody, not everybody thinks about this one. Um, it, this is somewhat of an oxymoron because Google loves when you have content that is personalized and is exactly what that visitor was looking for. Um, but also Google doesn't like poor performance, right? So personalization efforts can create slower page loading, especially when personalizing multiple components on a single page. Um, this is something I'm sure somebody out there is working on. But the reality is that if you have multiple content, pieces of content that uh, can be shown on a page, it limits caching and load speed. It just does. And that can affect your SEO. So uh, one, of the, one of the good ways to offset that is if you're using a content uh, delivery network, you can offset that somewhat and speed up your content delivery. It's not perfect, but you, 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 it's something to watch out for. Um, if you're getting into personalization and you don't take your eyes off, uh, or if you're getting into personalization, don't take your eyes off your SEO ranking um, if they are important to you. Number two, uh, be careful not to create duplicate content. Pretty obvious, but it does happen. Also a big SEO no-no. And then this last one, just really just a tip, because we've gone into places where they didn't have the right redirect set up. Make sure that if, you're, uh, if you have multiple landing pages, you're, us you're using 302 redirects instead of 301 redirects, right? Privacy. All right. Uh, if, if I did this presentation next year, this exact same presentation, this will probably be completely different, right? Uh, obviously, this is a super hot topic. GDPR, 
we're all dealing with that. New browser requirements, uh, they're making this all a moving target. So at this point, it looks like uh, cookie consent is quickly becoming a standard, right? Um, all that can affect what you track, uh, your data quality, and something you're probably already sweating, your Google Analytics numbers. My, my, now I can't get all my numbers in, so suddenly it looks like I have less people coming to the site. Um, this is a huge problem for everybody. Uh, so I'd expect this to shift more in the coming year. Um, but yeah, it's a big hurdle we all have to jump at this point. Number two, privacy, privacy policies and transparency. One thing that is clear is that you need to have a transparent privacy policy. Uh, not only is it important to update yours anytime you change your, what, you're, what you're taking from people, um, but it's just the right thing to do. I wish I knew what the future holds on this topic, uh, but at this point it's just to pre prepare for more regulation. It's probably coming, right? Uh, I wish I wouldn't end the tips with that kind of bummer one, but we do have our uh, key takeaways here. Um, these are things you should probably write down if you've been taking notes. Uh, number one, realistically, plan and research. Number two, uh, know your limitations. Number three, connect your goals with your stakeholders. And then most important, no matter what, where you start, start slowly. It is the number one thing. So emphasis there. All right, we are at Q&A. How fast did I go? All right, we're at um, 40 minutes. So we have about well, 14 minutes left, really. Um, who's got questions? You've been working on a question. Yeah, I guess it's about um, tips on how to analyze. Mm. Oh, yeah. Personalize that. Um, and I know in the planning, there's some very clear ideas. You know, if you click on this, you want, you're interested in this program. Right. We'll take you down this way. At the same time, my niece is going through uh, this, you know, surfing for school. I know she's not that close. You know what I mean? She's right. Exploring, and just because she clicks on one thing, I know she doesn't need, really need to be locked into. Right. Right, right. I think, I think it comes down to uh, when you're developing content for personalization, trying to keep it simple, right? Everybody wants to have that perfect experience where it's like exactly what that person wanted, move them to the next step, move them to the next step. Um, so simplify it. Start off simplifying it and then build upon that from at that point. And also when you're doing personalized content, you still have to give people the option to get go to a different spot, right? You don't want to get them stuck in that, in that, that one user journey where they can't get out. Um, so it's, uh, I hate to say that some of, the, uh, some of the bigger suites do make that a lot easier. Um, there's, like I said before, there's, there's AI learning now that's being incorporated in these types of things. And they will, it, it, it will give you good uh, information on how people are doing it and give you reports and give you suggestions on what, where to adjust. Um, so I, I hate to say, go to the biggest platforms you can get and make that work, but that does make it simpler. So it, it, it shortens the analyst analysis process, and you can adjust based on what it's recommending and try it. And just A-B test it, right? We're talking about A-B testing a lot when personalization. Anybody else? Question? Yeah. Yeah. What's a good starting amount of time to, to test for that? Like a, a thing it's probably, uh, for that kind of thing, you're, you're, it depends on how many people are coming to the site, right? Because it, it scales, oh, right? So if, you, if you're only getting you know, 100 people to your site a week, uh, you know, 20% are doing this, but that's just 
20 people out of 100. If it, once you get to uh, higher numbers, so that's something where you're talking about setting expectations with the stakeholders, because if you're getting just a little bit of data at a time and you're building up your reporting, you're gonna get better answers by the longer you, you start collecting. So um, it's not, there's no like set amount of time for, for anybody, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of your personalization to be able to determine. You have to feel comfortable with it, right? So once you get to a point where you go, guys, we've got enough numbers here that we can go, we're pretty sure we can try something like this, and then A-B test it, and then uh, A-B test again, and then you're getting to a point where you're gonna feel like you've made some movement, and hopefully your KPIs are supporting it. Anybody else, Q&A? No? Are there digital plugins for things like grabbing data on spot, um, outside of the smart watch model? Sure, sure. Um, generally, they'll, they'll have some sort of integration, so um, HubSpot can integrate with Drupal. Um, almost any of the big CRMs can integrate with Drupal, so they will pull data out of your website. Uh, again, the, there's levels of what you can get from any of these based on how much you want to pay, of course. Uh, but yeah, they're, integrating is a fairly straightforward process. If you have a web team internally, they can usually help you with that. If you have a partner that you're working with, they can help you with that. Um, but that is a pretty common setup um, so you'll be able to find somebody to do it. Stop by booth 608 if you want to hear more about it. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about your changing your SEO tag. Oh right. Okay. Sure. But we don't want to wait to load the information because that hurts SEO. Right. So you're saying, just so I'm clear, you're you 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 want to you want to change the content on the page, but you're concerned about how how that'll affect SEO. Yeah, because you can LCD and CLS, the, the layout shifts and loading the page have to be like immediate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now we want to swap it will likely affect your SEO. It, it, and that's just the reality of it. Because if you can't cache, if you can't be loading information quickly, fat, it, and it has to adjust based on who's coming there, it, it does slow the page down. You now, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's that's getting more technical than I, I have the ability to get into. But we have somebody technical at Booth Six Hundred Eight. <laughs> Anybody else? Q and A. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. Come to our come to our booth and get your swag optimized. It, it, it's it's easy. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, and I've got cards up here. We, our business cards are old baseball cards, so you can kind of choose who you want to be. Um, it's kind of fun. So if you want a card, got some up here, or booth 608.